Hello, I am Jonathan Leonard and this is the first of three videos on how consciousness works inside our heads. To me, these are exciting videos. That's not because they tell us anything about the soul or reincarnation or the fundamental nature of the universe. It's because they tell us some of the things that brain science has learned about the awareness that each of us experiences all day, every day, as consciousness. I would like to start with a note of caution. We don't fully understand how consciousness works, yet consciousness is vital to ourselves to a point where it demands some sort of ad hoc personal explanation. And since there is no science of consciousness worthy of the name, Consciousness has long fallen prey to gurus of all stripes. That has driven hard scientists away in droves, almost as though consciousness were the bubonic plague, because they don't want to be tarred with the brush of the guru's unscientific methods. This, of course, is not a new situation. It is many centuries old. So over the years, all of this has had the effect of deepening the mystery encouraging a series of wild goose chases and dragging in weird mind-body theories or quantum physics or whatever happens to be fashionable at the moment and in the process making the truth ever harder to perceive. But however murky the picture, one thing about consciousness seems clear. That one thing is that consciousness is intimately associated with the brain. If you destroy the brain, or even certain small parts of the brain, consciousness ends. And if you damage the brain, in any of innumerable ways, that alters consciousness in one way or another. Now I am not denying that quantum physics, or New Age theories, or Catholic theology, or Buddhist principles, or fortune-telling techniques, or even mysticism might not have something to tell us about human consciousness. But I am not associated with any of those things. Rather, I am a scientific and medical reporter deeply involved with brain science. And I firmly believe that if you see a duck out on a lake and hear a quack, and you want to know about the source of that quack, you should investigate the duck, despite the possible relevance of quantum physics and other theoretical approaches to understanding the situation. That, in brief, is what this series of videos on consciousness and the human brain seeks to do. I said a moment ago that no science of consciousness worthy of the name exists, and that's perfectly true. But brain science has been advancing rapidly in recent years, and some of what it has learned relates to consciousness. So it's worth examining these bits and pieces of brain science knowledge, putting them together as best we can, and hearing what they have to say. To prepare for that, let's first examine some basic properties of human consciousness. Basically, consciousness is awareness. But it's more than just simple awareness. Plants can be aware of the sun as they demonstrate by following it around, though few but horticultural romantics would ascribe any real consciousness to them. As commonly understood, consciousness means elevating awareness to a point where the conscious creature is aware of itself, is aware of the outside world to some degree, and can use that awareness of the world to act on its own behalf. All this requires an information processing system, in other words, a brain. Thus, according to our emerging definition, simply receiving information raw from nature, even very involved information, does not yield consciousness. Rather, the information must be processed until it acquires meaning. And so, instead of being simple awareness, consciousness is awareness of certain information processed by the brain. We can probe further by setting out certain key features of consciousness, describing those features, and relating them to activities within the brain. Four features that stand out are as shown. Consciousness is more limited than one might think because it receives limited information. 
You have only one sense of consciousness, and it is by nature unitary. The binding together of neural activity that is needed to achieve a unitary sense of consciousness requires intense neural coordination, so consciousness is highly coordinated. And finally, the most likely reason for going through this extensive coordination is to provide coherent biological management. And so it seems reasonable to suppose that consciousness has a biological purpose and that this purpose is to serve as the brain's general manager. Let's start by looking at our first feature, the limited nature of human consciousness. The cause of that limited nature is not hard to find. First, sensory inputs to the brain are limited. We don't hear all sounds, smell all smells, or see all sights. We don't perceive the high-pitched sounds used by bats to navigate, or the polarization of light perceived by bees, nor do we spot rodents from thousands of feet up like eagles. Indeed, we sense only a small part of all electromagnetic radiation, which we term the visible part, and we receive virtually none of the information that might otherwise be passed along by X-ray, radio, microwave, infrared, or ultraviolet radiation. More surprising, the images that come to us through our eyes are not nearly so detailed as they seem. In fact, the really high quality detail is limited to an area about the size of your thumbnail viewed at arm's length. You can affirm this by looking at our chart or by perusing a printed page and trying to read other words five lines up or down without moving your eyes. If you keep the page at a normal reading distance, you will find that even this minor displacement reduces the detail so much that the words become illegible. A likely reason for all these limitations is that the brain needs to process information before that information can be used. Receiving vastly more data than could be processed effectively might squander the brain's limited resources. So these severe restrictions on inputs may have survival value, because instead of encouraging the brain to process lots of information superficially, they position it to do intense work on manageable flows of data. Another limitation on consciousness is that only a small part of the data received by the brain actually enters consciousness. When you hear me speak, for instance, you get my meaning. But you pay little attention to the specific bursts of sound coming in, the words formed by those sounds, or even the sentences formed by the words. You can focus on these things if you wish, but you hardly ever do. And so these things typically remain unconscious. In this way, continual barrages of sensory and bodily inputs get processed but you are oblivious to nearly all of them because only certain selected results enter your conscious mind. Same thing with outputs. You take a sip of tea, without thinking much about it. You're not aware of the well-drilled militia of procedural memories called to arms or the extensive feedback loops needed to perform this act. You're not conscious of them, any more than you are conscious of the incredible acrobatics behind other procedures you call up. Everything from walking, talking, singing, running, and driving to coordination of language, thought, and decision-making and other internal brain functions. Some of these procedures are summoned consciously, but you are conscious of the resulting procedural coordination only marginally, if at all. In other words, consciousness benefits from mountains of unconscious processing. It does so in several ways. It benefits from sophisticated sensory processing. You're unaware of all the preliminaries, but you know the gentleman coming toward you down the street is a policeman. And the same with feelings. You're not aware of most internal bodily monitoring that produces feelings, 
but you know that the approaching policeman makes you feel edgy, thankful, or whatever. And again, same thing with outputs. You can speed your steps to approach the policeman or cross the street to avoid him by simply willing it without paying much attention to anything but novel elements like the location of curbs, pedestrians, cars, and traffic signals without consciously directing the details. What this implies is that human consciousness is not general awareness of information processed by the brain. Rather, it is awareness of certain limited information selected and coordinated by the brain. This brings me to the end of my first video on the basic nature of consciousness and the limited but highly processed information entering the realm of consciousness. My next video describes three other features of consciousness, how it is unitary, highly coordinated, and managerial.